Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the today's webinar. I'm Shiva, and most of you might be knowing me from my emails. In today's session, we'll be discussing challenging pandemic with digital to drive business growth. To take us through the webinar, we have Yoab Dogan, Chief Operating Officer of Mother Finance, Arno Stabalt, CEO and founder of Lookout Solution Pty Ltd, Rhinos Mausta, Director of Tech24 Group, and Sachin Bhatia, co-founder of Ameo. Mr. Yoab is CEO of Mother Finance, which has a staff complement of around 70 people at present. Focused on financial services, insurance sector, Yob was a key member in building out an online insurance company that ultimately became acquired by one of the big four banks in South Africa. Two years ago, Yob joined an established group whose focus was in marketing arena and has set out to establish a new business in financial sector. That is called While focusing on strategy, product, and operations, Yob is deeply involved in distribution, of which a call center has always been a key component. Welcome, Yob. Thank you. Mr. Arno is founder and CEO of Blue Cloud PTY LCD. Arno is striving leading edge solution with the focus on service excellence and intention to make significant contribution to contact center industry in South Africa. He has more than three decades of experience in contact center and telecommunication uh, industry, working with Siemens, Unify, and Nausea Communication. Arno holds a national degree in Diploma of Electrical uh, Engineering from University of Port Elizabeth. He lives in Johannesburg, South Africa with his family and enjoys camping, cycling, squash, golf, and a good South African braai with family and friends. Welcome, Arno. Thank you. Can see the Mr. Bride. Rhinos. Yes. <laughs> uh, Mr. Rhinos is a multiple award winning entrepreneur and a business uh, and with the businesses in construction, ICT, education, and energy. He is director at Tech24, Pico Construction, Energy Plus International, and Chartered Institute of Customer Management, which is in 40s countries. He is also excellent. <clears throat> Uh, excellent executive uh, executive secretary of Contact Center Association of Zimbabwe. He is a holder of several qualifications, including MBA uh, from MSU and uh, executive leadership degree from Oxford. Welcome, Dinos. Mr. Sachin is a co-founder and head global sales and marketing for Ameo, a computer scientist by education and a product person by heart. Sachin has been involved in understanding needs and delivering customer engagement solution for consumer facing companies. He has been working with CIOs and customer experience holders in over 60 countries over the last 16 years and believes problems in emerging market needs a unique solution. Welcome Sachin. Thank it you is so a pleasure much, to have you all. Yeah. Uh, it is a pleasure <clears throat> to have you all on today's panel. Just a Little housekeeping before we start. Uh, if you have any question during this uh, discussion, please type them into the question box of your go to webinar control panel. We will bring them up at the end of this discussion along with the questions we have received through registration forms. Now I would like to invite Mr. Sachin to initiate this discussion. Over to you, Sachin. Thank you so much, Shiva, and very, very excited to be amongst partners, friends, and customers. Uh, Arno, Rhinos, you are, uh, thank you so much for coming in. And I've been told that we are joined by 100 over people from uh, mostly the uh, Southern African region, but we also have folks joining in from Asia, Middle East, and even India. Uh, this is the, perhaps the last series in our Conversations 20, uh, which was completely virtual. Conversation 19, we actually visited most countries and uh, did sessions, but uh, interesting times call for interesting solutions. So we've been able to uh, you know, run this across, uh, I think the 16th country uh, completely virtually. 
Okay, so uh, the topic given to us uh, challenging pandemic with uh, digital, uh, with, uh, with digital to drive business growth. Let me just quickly share my slides and I will bring in my experts uh, you know, as and when uh, uh, there are thoughts and stories to be shared by them. Just give us a second there. Shiva, can you see if I have the permission to share my screen or maybe you already are sharing some? Yeah, okay, thank you so much. Just confirm if you're able to view my screen. We can. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there are three important areas that we want to touch today and each of them is uh, quite significant in Taking them uh, during the discussion. Uh, we also will unveil some poll results that we have been doing across Conversations 20 on uh, some of these topics. And these are very valuable insights on what your peer group folks are thinking in the region that you are and otherwise in the world about uh, running contact centers during pandemic and what is changing actually. So without further ado, let me jump to the agenda. We're going to touch a little bit about a topic which is very close to my heart, uh, which is <clears throat> the importance of human to human engagement in what we are calling today a contactless world. Uh, these are very, very interesting times and uh, we have been forced into what we call as contactless world, both physically and you know, people uh, you know, working remotely and physical meetings are absolutely um, zero. So is that changing anything? For the contact center would be the first topic. The second is we've heard that digital transformation and the pandemic has forced us six years ahead in uh, in terms of adopting digital. What does it really mean? Uh, is it is it bots? Is it channels? Uh, should we go overboard uh, thinking digital? What have we observed around the world? Is something we'll uh, talk to our experts about. And the third uh, is running contact centers completely remote. Is that is that uh, uh, a dream? Is that a reality which has been forced upon us? And what if the pandemic goes away tomorrow? Will will remote stay or will remote uh, go away? So those are the three topics that we wanted to talk about. There are uh, there are things that we have on the solution side, but we would rather cover uh, um, you know mostly on these uh, three. And uh, anyone who is in touch with us, uh, uh, we can share the solutions uh, later on. But let's let's jump into the first topic which is the human to human uh, engagement in the contacts this world now let me let me start by asking uh, uh, you know, a story or a question to everybody in the audience post the pandemic of course we we are forced to meet lesser and lesser number of people physically but my question to everybody is are we more in touch with our friends and families or we are less in touch with our friends and families pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, right? Think about it. And in my personal experience, I'm actually more in touch. And the more I think about it deeply, I think uh, these are anxious times, right? Uh, we, are, we are insecure, we are uh, anxious about our health, we are anxious about the businesses. And, and think about what can take care of anxiety. It's, it's usually talking to someone you trust, talking to someone you love in your personal relationships, which which makes anxiety go away. So now transpose the same in a business to consumer scenario. Are consumers more anxious or less anxious? I believe they are more anxious, whether my order is going to be delivered, can I get this? Are you serving this area? There are more questions uh, people have today, which means that this is an opportunity to provide human to human engagement or human to human support to your customers because it's anxious times. So with those thoughts, let me open up by bringing in you have uh, you have you be, you've been in the business of uh, uh, you know running businesses which are driven through contact centers. Uh, what are your thoughts? Is is human to human uh, interaction more important, less important in the post pandemic world? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks, Session, for the introduction. So um, yeah, in our world, predominantly. Um, 
Yeah, predominantly in the call center. No, it's, it's, it still remains important. And um, what we've sort of learned through the pandemic is, uh, itself, um, we, we quickly, we very quickly, like I think uh, most other businesses, got working from home. And um, we realized that you can very quickly lose touch whilst you can, in initial phases, be, uh, I suppose, efficient and um, meet certain productivity measures. Um, it sort of tapers off quite quickly and it's difficult to keep that ongoing relationship uh, and the team, the unity, and uh, everything else that typically comes with the uh, human sort of, yeah, the human touch and the, yeah, the human to human contact. So I think if anything, it sort of matters, realize how important it is. Um, it's nice to know that technologies are in place that if you need to, you don't have to be. Um, but I think long term, it's sort of just shown us that uh, there is definitely a need for that, um, for that human, yeah, the, the contact. Yeah. We also observed, uh... Uh, guys, if you think of it, you know, some of the processes that earlier used to be physical touch dependent and the slide is actually indicating that. Think of support, service, sales, collections, right? These are very core functions that are typically driven through the contact center. And think of the processes pre-pandemic, right? They were, mostly they were physical touch points that were required in some of these. This was high value sale. Then, uh, uh, you know, a face-to-face -face meeting used to happen. If this is a loan, then uh, personal discussion for approval used to happen. Uh, and across verticals, you know, you will see that these processes required a bit of physical touch point. And given that those physical touch points are restricted or uh, reduced or sometimes even zero, the contact center is the only channel which can provide the human to human engagement that is required. So what we have observed is that contact centers are coming into the centerpiece where they are driving business KPIs and not just stuff like average handling time they're actually talking about sales being driven through contact center completely right so arno you have you have been in touch with a lot of customers who run contact centers in uh, in southern africa what are you viewing in terms of volumes that are coming in or or is there anything changing that you have observed in the contact center or how they think about the business yeah so Sachin, thanks um so yeah, look, um, the, definitely the human-to-human -human interaction is still um, the key part. I think uh, human beings are naturally social beings. And uh, specifically, if you're under stress or you're under pressure, you'd want to specifically uh, speak to somebody, um, you know, a, another human being that can understand you, that can assist you, um, that's got some empathy for your problem. Uh, I think that and that's a, the biggest part of the differentiation going forward, in my view, is that uh, the, the new generation, um, Generation X, um, you know, they they prefer to engage with via chat or online. And I think that obviously, if it's anything that you would like to, uh, from a service perspective, that you'd like to get done, you'd like to get it done quickly, um, those channels are really um, important. Um, but as soon as you are emotionally involved or you're under pressure or you've got a real crisis in your life that you need something resolved urgently, I uh, mean, for me and for the people I know and I've, I've experienced, people still, um, you know, uh, prefer to pick up the phone and call somebody. Preferably, they would like to go on a video call if that is at, at all a possibility. I um, mean, you know, from, from our perspective over this time, what has really been key, fortunately for us, you know, Google meeting, uh, Teams meetings, uh, Zoom meetings, those type of things um, have really uh, assisted us in, in, in keeping contact with our customers during this time which I think you would have totally lost that um, human to human engagement um, if you didn't have those means of communication. Yeah, no, the, I'll tell you one interesting example that I observed uh, from the market, uh, which is very close to me, India. Now, there used to be a process called KYC, which uh, I think a lot of countries have that once you're opening an account or even uh, you know getting a new customer on board, there is some basic customer information to be collected and authenticated right uh, depending on the the requirement now reserve bank of india which is sort of the central governing body uh, in january of this year has announced uh, had announced that you could use video as a medium to capture uh, that uh, uh, kyc uh, and there was very little adoption because people still said no i can walk into a branch and do that and lo and behold come february right the lockdowns were started to be discussed march uh, there was no physical movement allowed and kyc just took off like crazy because that that was one process that required a human being to assess 
that whether what the other other guy is saying is correct or not and collect that data and today uh, kyc has super high adoption in india and is being completely driven from the contact centers so that's you know like this this uh, kyc process did not have contact center in uh, in even in the play earlier and today the whole kyc process is being driven from the contact center uh, so that's one example and i know you mentioned about channels and you mentioned you know chat and video so our second yeah. section uh, is about that digital channels right uh there is so much discussion about uh, a pandemic pushing us into uh, a transformation uh, of how businesses are using digital using it using automation uh, and, and and there have been real real uh, changes there but uh, i have two questions for my panelists here first is bots do you think uh there has been an increased adoption on uh, bots are people experimenting more or are these in production uh, and what would be good use cases of bots and the second is use of other channels right we have also seen that there's an increase in uh, real time channels like chat even passive channels like social media and uh, definitely the most engaging channel is video so these channels have uh, entered into the customer engagement contact center b2c right b2b is completely run on video right now like what we are doing right now but b2c also we have seen very very solid adoption so maybe you can share some stories uh, from your side and rhinos we missed you on the last question so why don't i bring you in have you seen uh, adoption of newer channels increasing and and what are your thoughts on the bots <clears throat> Uh, Rhinos, you seem to be not connected to the audio. Can you just check that uh, and confirm once? In the meantime, let me bring in you up for the same question. You have uh, uh, you have been uh, in the operations in the heat of you know running businesses through contact centers. Any uh, any new changes that have happened because of uh, uh, digital channels or bots in in your area of uh, expertise? Well, can you hear me now, Sachin? Yes, I know. I can hear you. Uh, I can hear you well now. Ah, uh, perfect. No, thank you so much once again for having me. Yes, uh, we have seen some drastic changes, especially in terms of adoption of channels. Uh, out, in, you know, in Southern Africa, South Africa is a bit ahead uh, as compared to other countries within Southern Africa in terms of the adoption of technology. But what we have seen now in terms of uh, migration from voice centered channel to other channels. We have seen uh, people adopting videos, uh, adopting uh, WhatsApp, uh, adopting other channels like um, maybe integrating also uh, some SMS, web, web chats, integrating all those channels within the contact center. So we have seen that increasing because of maybe the pandemic. And I think this is going to be a new normal going forward uh, as we, the customers also, well, the customers are now used i mean to that changes and because of that we are going to see especially if i'm speaking about zimbabwe and zambia maybe we have seen that most customers and uh, potential customers also when you are they are making some inquiries about maybe their contact center setup or if they want to adopt some new technologies they are talking about integrating all the channels why because the research is also informing that uh, the customers they really want their focus to be on the WhatsApp, the chat, the web chat are uh, going forward. So I think there's a huge change that is happening. Yeah, I think WhatsApp is one uh, one channel where we have seen in, in parts where we are operating that that as a channel, and this is a very interesting journey with WhatsApp. So a typical journey is you will get a notification, let's say your order is confirmed, or your delivery is coming, or let's say your collections is due, and you can actually respond back to that message and there'll be a bot or a human being on the other side who can respond to it. So this message, bot, human being, that journey is very, very seamless on uh, on a medium like WhatsApp. You have, sorry, I, 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 I tried bringing you in. Uh, can you come in uh, and uh, share what you've seen in your line of business uh, in South Africa in terms of adoption of digital channels and specifically bots? So I think, um, yeah, so I think there's a few points to make there. So number one, sort of my take on it is that it's bots and any digital channels 
are, are very specific to a, a market segment, a socioeconomic class, as well as an age band. I think, um, personally, I don't foresee bots as the, as the future outright. I don't need to go into a way with a contact center. Um, just to elaborate earlier on, I said human to human, the necessity, the necessity for it. I was talking more internally as far as staff is concerned and uh, remote working, but um, contact center, I don't see that falling away in any, any time in the near future. I just think there's too many nuances for us uh, around bots. First of all, the products, the complexities. Um, I think there's room for bots for very specific, simplified products. It's quick solutions. Once you get into the more complex product and more regulatory, centered around the regulatory environment, there's just that much more that you have to cater for. And um, as I mentioned, just personally, my experience has not been all that positive. We've been able and been successful to take our very simplified products and do it via the bot channel. But as I mentioned, um, I think you're cutting out, especially in South Africa, you're probably cutting out a minimum of like 75% of your potential client base as far as acquisition is concerned. Um, just by future, people are comfortable to transact on bots, um, number one, and as well as those who have access to using the bots. Um, right, you get those individuals who have the devices, have the connection, have the data, just not comfortable to transact on bots. Um, so that's from an acquisition perspective. Also, typically I find, again, unless the product is highly simplified, your conversion rate tends to be a lot lower in the bots. It's a lot easier to just exit the application process than it is on a, on a, to a contact center. And the consequences of that is that your, your acquisition costs just become become unaffordable, you end up basically selling loss-making loss products. To the, to the extent that, and I'm sure most companies do it, anybody who starts a bot and doesn't finish, that becomes a lead into our contact center. So yeah, my, my view is, uh, is it can be, it's a, it's a very niche market, it's, it's a lot smaller, a lot more expensive, there's definitely room for it, and it, one needs to focus on it, and you have to adapt to it, but as it stands, I'm not building my business you have the the example Perfect, that that much more. yeah cool. yeah the example that you gave on acquisition and cost of acquisition i think is a very very significant point even we have seen that uh, you can use bots for very specific use cases and they do a good job there but uh, yeah. you know when you're making a sale so for example if it's data collection or one of the bots that uh, we have been able to reasonably successful with is uh, uh, a simple collection reminder bot, right? So in a collections call, you're typically calling someone and asking a date for when he would, when he or she would make a payment. And just this step, a bot can do it better. But as soon as there is anxiety, say, I'm not sure, you know, I might not be able to pay. You need a human being to come in at that point of time. But uh, you know, 30, 40, 50% of the calls, in this case were handled by the bot successfully but in a sales use case uh, i would i would think twice before putting my acquisition process in front of the bot maybe just a small data collection but uh, it might not be worth it but on the service side as well as collection side we have seen some adoption there now bots has uh, you know bot has made a lot of promise and unfortunately uh, and i am a technology guy you know the promise is that they can understand everything Remember that bot has to be trained on a lot of data using natural language processing and yeah. it can only understand what it has been taught, right? So it needs a lot of training sure. data. Maybe Arno, I can bring you in that uh, which areas do you think bots doing really well and where should Sasha, people experiment with? Yeah, yeah just sorry, Sasha, before we go to Arno, just to finish the, the point I was saying, just to distinguish yeah, yeah. in my world is that I was saying so there's acquisitions and I simplified but I, I do think in customer experience, exactly talking to your point, from customer experience, customer servicing perspective, it's just a lot that it's, it's that much more difficult. Um, I personally, as a consumer, get very frustrated when websites and companies try to throw bots because if it doesn't follow the exact decision tree, you hit the dead end, you would have been better off just phoning. And uh, everyone purports to have AI in place, but I haven't seen anybody actually use AI where the bot can actually interpret what you're saying and come with the next uh, correct, sequence of events. But sorry, Anna, that's just to finish you off to hand over to you. No, no, but, but absolutely. It, it has to be a very, very clear decision tree. But I know, yeah, let, let's bring the engineer in. What do you think? When would the bot work? Yeah, look, so I, I think um, what, what you're saying is absolutely spot on. Um, from an outbound sales perspective, and we 
I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm in India and not um, born, but not myself and not, but, um, you know, it's probably one of the most difficult things to do. And without the human component around that, and, you know, it's a case of convincing your customer about, you know, why this is um, that important to them, you know, why is it all the problem of I don't see that in the it, and maybe what Google can produce in their big data center or something like that could do something of that nature, but not something that's really available to the counter today. Um, but where I do see a big role played uh, from a, and where I get a lot of inquiries, is from a customer service perspective. So what we typically find is that, you know, um, customers, specifically smaller customers or um, retailers or um, any product vendors, um, have got quite a big challenge matching the... Challenge matching the... Uh, I don't know why I've got that feedback now. Okay, I think I'll, we're back now. Um, yeah. So, got quite a big uh, challenge, um, you know, uh, balancing amount of staff they got to service their customers on the one side and, the you know, the cost of that staff and then obviously the inquiries from their customers. Now, you can't have 100% uh, staff availability at all time. Um, so, the requirement really comes around, you know, trying to take away the mundane tasks from the from your agents, um, so that you only utilize your agents for those tasks that cannot be fulfilled by the bots. So, you know, typical example would be somebody needs to apply for a loan, for example. Um, go to the web, uh, WhatsApp channel. There's an option. I, I'm looking for a um, a loan form or how do I apply for a loan? The system can tell you, you need this form, that, this, that, and the other thing that will tell you, it can send those things to you. There's no human interaction required. But as soon as the person I get stuck with a form and he's not sure whether he should add this ID or does he need to do that, um, ideally you'd want to, to be able to communicate directly to, to an actual agent. But in doing that, you'd want to um, move about uh, well, about 60-80% of your functionality to the bot, mundane functionality, and let your actual um, agents deal with the requirements that can't be handled by the bot. I think that's obviously the perfect balance if you can get to that point. Awesome. You know, we observed that across the board for customer service inquiries, there's a 20 to 25% increase uh, in the pandemic time because, uh, you know, obviously the other channels are not available. And Arno brings in a very important point. It that doesn't mean that you will temporarily increase the staff, especially on the customer service side, because cost pressures are really, really high, margins are thin. So uh, one of the things, there are two uh, sort of hacks that I have observed uh, from our experience. The first is, and it's a simpler hack, that you convert inbound to outbound, which means, uh, you know, because inbound is such a variable volume that you don't know how many calls would come in at any point of time. But if, for example, you could say, as soon as somebody calls in, we are experiencing very high traffic, uh, we would get back to you. You don't need to do anything. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. And make sure that the outbound calls are spread out across the day. That way your staffing requirements would uh, reduce by uh, you know, as high as 15, 20%, even if uh, you know, the volumes, because there is a variability in volume. That's one. Uh, and it's a simple hack that I've seen even large, very large companies in India adopting in remote uh, uh, operations, and it has worked really well for them. And the second is uh, having a bot take the initial information of qualification that what was the, you know, like what you, what IVR used to do, but IVR was really, really poor at it because you have to go sequentially, but you could actually have uh, basic information collected that what was the call about, uh, even take some data from CRM that are you talking about this, uh, so that the qualification, uh, and these calls are what, two minutes, you know, 90 seconds to 120 seconds. If you can take off even 10 to 20 seconds of that call, that's an efficiency of eight to 10%, which is huge in customer service. Eight to, eight to 12% is the complete gross margin of that business. So these are two hacks that I learned uh, during the pandemic that, uh, some of the operations uh, folks have used and uh, very, very easy to uh, do. I think your existing tools might be able to do it. But let's come to the third and the mood point. Uh, gentlemen, we were we were all forced into remote working ourselves and even the contact centers in most places. Uh, let me bring in the, uh, the, the panelists here and 
just uh, think of that march april time frame you know whenever whenever it was hitting in your region uh, what were the first reactions of the contact centers and how did they cope with it because it was it was havoc in india i mean we had to move like 50000 people remote uh, in a span of one one and a half weeks while we were operating remotely so that is what i remember about that time but can you share some of the stories of did uh, did did your businesses or your your observations did people completely go remote and and what did you guys uh, see rhinos maybe i'll bring you in first uh, what did you see in zimbabwe while were lockdowns enforced and were people operating remotely and what do you remember about it okay thank you so much sachin i i think i hope you are, you can hear me and uh, yes. i think uh, the pandemic when it came obviously it had happened in china and uh, we we knew it companies all the companies they knew it that is coming this wave is coming to africa as well but all the companies or most companies were you, you prepared for it because what happened now customer experience before the pandemic was still bad then when the pandemic came it became worse and companies were also not ready in terms of their systems their processes they were not ready for this and what happened now just imagine if you are now shifting and having some agents who are now working from home and those agents some of them they didn't have connect connection at home and some of them they didn't have maybe some 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 laptops to work to work from that's why there's now now a new wave of demand to say can we work from our our cell phones can we connect our contact center so that an agent can connect via a cell phone remember it's a huge cost that was wasn't budgeted for for companies so they wanted now to come up with other mitigation measures that can really bridge the gap and also the other thing that we have seen also companies had already existing service delivery issues so with remote working it became worse why because if you are measuring remember you'll be measuring agents on calls but the number of drop, dropped calls will, will increase were also increasing because of the remote working and also the number or maybe the service level also went down why because the agents we used to answer maybe 140 calls was now answering maybe 90 calls and also the connect connectivity challenge the power challenge which is also common across uh, across uh, south southern africa and also if you are to check the other issues or the other challenges that we had information gap there was a huge information gap especially uh, during the pandemic and um, the product knowledge but for those who had maybe advanced contact centers where they'll be having product knowledge portals and stuff, it really helped out. Then also budgets, companies, they didn't have budget for this. So it became a very huge issue for most companies. And uh, then customer experience was also affected. But for some companies, they, would drive, they just said, no, we don't have budget for this. And they'll just have maybe some, maybe some emergency team on the side so that they will attend to priority customers, which became a very huge issue, especially from where I'm seated, because I represent the industry association, and I'm also a business person also in the tech space. So from the association point of view, we have seen even the National Customer Satisfaction Index for the whole country. We did a survey as an association, and the index went down, and thanks to mm. COVID, which contributed to that uh, negative experience. And also the culture issues. Remember, Sachin, if you are to talk about the technology adoption or adoption of technology, obviously to bridge the gap uh, that was brought about by the pandemic, uh, you, you can't just bring a new technology without uh, changing the culture. Because you need to change the culture so that you can have a, a, some sense of you know, uniformity across the whole team from the top executives to the junior staff. But if the couch is wrong, it, at the end of the day, it affects the deployment of that technology and the experience won't even improve even after adopting the technology. So this was also one of the pain areas that we have been seeing across the industry. And not only in Zimbabwe, this was also the same in Zambia. And uh, right now, at least people now, they are now used to it. We are seeing some change, some changes and a shift now as people are now adopting some other cheaper technologies and they are also using maybe WhatsApp. And WhatsApp sometimes is not uh, expensive in terms of uh, data consumption 
you don't need much power for it you can just use it over the phone they are using web charts so web charts they are also easy to use but uh integration is now handy and this is something this is a big business especially here in southern africa thanks thanks rainos and i think you covered a lot of areas from and i remember the first week the biggest thing that we were hearing from our customers was our agents don't have laptops right and i think the and we just it just hit us that man you can develop anything but what if the agent doesn't have laptop what do you do right and uh, i think we launched a mobile app in the first 10 days of the pandemic the first version of it and then we iterated every week and uh, today that mobile app i think has about 25000 agents every day logging on to that with complete contact center functionality not just a standalone mobile app but something that uh, the agent can use for uh, complex cti processing to predictive dialing uh, to uh, uh, you know knowing which call queue this call came from and it was a huge huge uh, advantage for our customers the other story i remember this was uh, one of the series that we did in the philippines where one of our customers one agent uh, everybody in philippines everybody stays in the provinces and they work in the city right so everybody is coming from outside of the city every day and then they're going back now there we had a very interesting story in the provinces the internet was not that great and the two telcos had launched the 5g router there but uh, the router was not available in the market because everybody was buying them uh, as soon as they hit the shelves they were gone right because everybody needed them from work from home so one of the contact center agents actually started the business of procuring routers and making sure that the 2000 agents in in that province are getting that router and he just from just that business idea in a week he was able to make a lot of money but you you got a lot of ingenuity because such problems never existed uh, in the market you have, what about in your your operations uh, did you did you go remote uh, what what were the considerations uh, you're also in the financial services where remote means you know even more issues but uh, what were your your observation yes i mean it's very much uh, i can echo what you both of you, yourself and uh, rhinos have said um became a bit of a logistical game actually the first week and sort of the, the last week leading up to it how do you get agents working from home and we experienced all the same issues you know we couldn't get dongles uh routers you know to get the guys to connect you couldn't secure laptops um so what we actually did is we converted everybody's machines and we got like delivery vans and every person got dropped off at home with their hard machine screen keyboard at home from the office um so it became very much a, a logistical game and um, yeah, so we got everybody there, but then we quickly realized that in certain locations, there's a lot of congestions on the network. In some cases, they don't have connectivity. So it became also just a, another huge hindrance. The whole country was now trying to run off network, uh, you know, everybody moving out of the offices. Um, so just increased congestions and um, obviously it impacted our connectivity rates, our sort of, and our talk time on the whole. But sort of after a few, few weeks, that, that seemed to have settled. And uh, then we just had a whole bunch of other real positive and negatives. You know, we were quite ambitious and we were quite excited affording the people the opportunity to work from home, save travel costs, save travel time, more quality time home with the family. But the reality is that the working conditions were a bit, uh, a bit tough on people. Some people live uh, in smaller homes than others, have more people living under one roof. And yet you find a, quarter, a, a corner in the kitchen from which you try and make a cell from. So um, yeah, it was, quite, uh, it was quite interesting. I mean, Testament to our staff, they all tried their best and uh, we, we saw our way through it. Mm -hmm. But um, sort of as we came out of lockdown, we realized that it is probably better. As many positives as are working from home, it's just from a sales perspective, just not the same as being in the office to motivate the guys, to build the unity, the culture. Uh, but from a customer service perspective and a quality assurance, the sort of more back office job, those guys are still working from home. So there we had no issue. But your hardcore acquisition that needs to, we need to find, need to be in the office. And then um, again, the Iranis mentioned, we had very similar issues. You know, we, we were going through load shedding in South Africa um, during that period. So we had COVID, lockdown, load shedding as well. At the office, you got your generator kicked, kicks in. Um, unfortunately, most people don't have a backup power supply. So if an area goes down, your, your contact center goes down. So that was our sort of uh, overall 
yeah, experience. As I said, we came up, we felt like we were running a logistics company for, 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 for a few weeks. Um, but once we got everybody set up, we made the most of it. We were able to monitor them from home. And um, yeah, as you said, the financial services, are, there were some concerns around how do you keep client confi- information confidential? You know, at the office, you can prevent them from bringing cell phones, mobiles onto the floor. How, how do you prevent and how do you sort of secure that from working from home? So, you know, we found ways around it, not 100% bulletproof, but yeah, it came with the challenges. But um, yeah, we were able to, to, to fight our way through it. So yeah, it was an interesting, it's been an interesting year. Awesome. With lots of learning. I would request, yeah, I would request Nimish to put up, uh, Nimish or Shiva to put up the poll uh, question on remote versus non remote while I discuss this with Arno. So uh, while the poll question is coming in, and we will give you a couple of minutes to fill in the poll, but there was a very interesting observation that we made after talking to our customers. You know, obviously, the initial time everybody was forced into remote, and people started operating remote. It was it was necessary. But uh, no, I want the other question to come in first. Can you guys do that? Uh, uh, you know, remote or not remote? Yeah, thank you. So the you know the initial reaction was we should go remote, and uh, and we will come back as soon as uh, the pandemic uh, gets over or when the government allows us. But there was a very important unit economic that you guys discovered here. Uh, I'm getting a lot of background noise. Maybe you guys can try going on mute. Yeah, there was a very interesting observation on uh, if let's say somebody is spending $100 on agent's salary, then how much is being spent on the infrastructure or the desk infrastructure I'm talking about. And in a, in a market in Southeast Asia or uh, India, that number was uh, 25%. So, so if you were spending, let's say $100 on, uh, to be more realistic, let's say $500 on agent salary, then you were spending $125 per month on agent's infrastructure. Now, if you look at contact centers, gross margin, that's roughly 10 to 12% of the overall revenue uh, in, in a typical scenario. Now, uh, the, the 25% infrastructure cost is actually roughly 10% of the overall expenditure, which means that if, I, if you're somehow able to get around that infrastructure cost, you're doubling your gross margin. Now, this unit economics was crazy. I mean, if you're not doing it and somebody else is able to do it successfully, then a lot of business is gonna go to them. Uh, and, and, and I'm not talking about a catch-all because there'll be exceptions like data security. But some of the processes where you can run this successfully, I think it will leapfrog you ahead of some of the other players in the market who are, who are just thinking about it as only temporary. So give it a very solid consideration because the unit economics are gonna get disrupted. Uh, uh, if you don't have the question, then it's okay. I will just present the because we'll run out of time and we have to take questions also. So we went and we went ahead in the market and asked uh, the leaders in um, uh, Africa that uh, do they think contact centers uh, will run remote? Is it a long-term thing, short-term thing, or they're still undecided? And uh, overwhelming 43% said long-term implementation. So remote is here to stay, pandemic or not, remote is gonna stay. Uh, 22 percent, 21 and a half percent people said it's short term till the pandemic uh, uh, goes away, and then 35.5 percent people said that uh, they are still undecided. But the 43 percent is a really, really large number. Remember that we have been in this pandemic for now four, five, six months, depending on where you are. And if somebody has been able to decide that yes, they're going to run remote, and remote doesn't mean it continues to run the same way, and we'll talk about that just in a minute, but that infrastructure cost is a very big unit economics driver that is gonna decide the future of how contact centers are gonna run uh, in, uh, in future. Uh, uh, Nimish, maybe the, the first poll itself, we can bring that up now because uh, that is the next topic I wanted to discuss. So we wanted to uh, learn from the audience that what are the top challenges of running it remote? We have heard a few challenges here and which ones do you focus on if you want to run remote? And we have three clear areas coming out. If there's a poll, then we can take it. Otherwise, uh, I think we might run out of time. So let me just cover that poll also. Uh, so this was uh, this was uh, asking the audience 
that what is the top deterrent for you in running the remote contact center and a clear top deterrent came to be it governance and security uh, and i'll come to arno uh, to talk about this one then second was onboard and collaboration let's say if, you know contact center is such a it's such a tribal function right people come in they, they there is a hustle they get inspired from each other if i am a new guy if i don't know anything i will not go to my knowledge base but ask ask my desk buddy hey man what do you do when when something like this happens that's how contact centers actually grow in culture but how do you now do the same thing uh, in a remote scenario and the third is the operations and monitoring in a in a uh, office environment everybody was focused on operating kpis average handling time speed of answer there's a wall board there's alarm but how do you now communicate those, those same slas and will the slas change or will the kpis change for uh, for the uh, agents so it requires a different way of uh, measurement those were the three top areas let me quickly cover uh, those three and bring in our experts uh, arno what have you seen on the it governance side i, I mean if you were in a office environment you you have a problem an agent is saying i am not able to log in you bring in the it guy he he checks and immediately resolves it but if somebody says the same thing from home what do you trust the network the device the agent what do you trust and how do you yeah. find that out any thoughts there yeah that that's been uh, one of the fundamental challenge from us because you know we've got a uh, majority of our customers are running off our cloud setup so most customers relocated with dongles and LTE connectivity, that type of thing. Uh, we, at, at some point at the height of the epidemic, must have gotten 20 calls a day from agents. I, I can't log on. People, there's a call connecting to me. I, you know, it's it's dropping the calls, this, that, and the other thing. And we actually end up doing some of our customers' um, uh, IT support for them. Because we would have to go and ask, because now we have to prove that is not the system that's the problem so get get remote connection to the guys pc check there oh, we've got 0.1 percent upload speed on your lte connection so why do you think it will actually work you know but you know every day and it's every day the same agent asking the same question there's obviously then the pressure to actually perform um but um you know the, the situation is that um so they're the pressure to, to perform their tasks so they've been pressurized but I mean, they've got these challenges and they're trying to pinpoint where it is. It's really not that easy. Um, yeah, yeah I worried. remember Yeah, when we launched the mobile app, uh, right? So the first feature request on the mobile app that we got is that agent should not be able to record the call on the mobile app. Uh, the second request we got is they should not be able to take a screenshot. And the third request we got was, uh, uh, can we know if everything is okay with the device? remotely right so and we were like we have never done uh, you know, we never had to have such things and then we realized the actual problem is that it's a low trust environment and not just trust uh, why do you wait for the agent to actually uh, notify a problem can that be proactively done let's say the agent's network is bad can that be proactively notified to the uh, it team so that if the agent is complaining they already have the notification in front of them or uh, uh, let's say if uh, if device is a problem right using an older device memory is not there that is uh, notified automatically to it because they are not there to see that device right every time the same question which device the guy will say android right now which android so how do i check the version so we had like a, a 15 minute qualification call on identifying the device every time my agent used to come in and we just said okay we will pass that information as soon as somebody installs the app what device what operating system what was the network latency at that point of time when the issue was reported and then we went on to actually publishing this as a real-time dashboard for all agents so this was a huge thing for our customers because then uh, they were able to proactively identify okay this guy is having a problem take him off the queue even before the agent is uh, actually mentioning that i have a problem and this was very big but it's a it's a big challenge that one has to look it's not just about using your current contact center solution and uh, asking the agent to log in from remote there are other problems that you would need to solve so that's the first area i want to talk about second and let me bring in uh, you are on this one onboarding collaboration 
when you were running remote and if let's say somebody is running remote today you are how would you recommend they do the uh, you know the new people how do they bring in the new people and how do they help collaborate the way they were doing uh, in office Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Perfect. So I think uh, I think the big difference between now, um, one big um, big factor that we all, everybody out there, was staff complement that was running. It was a case of how do you mobilize your 70 or your 250 agents to work from home? Um, most of those guys have really been onboarded. And that was very much the challenge that we experienced. How do you onboard new people? And very challenging to do so unless you're in the office. You know, you want to get the right culture, you've got to get the right training, the right support. If a person has a problem on a call, you know, you need the ability for him to put his hand up and get real-time support from his supervisor um, without negatively experiencing the, the customer experience. So yeah, as a whole, um, we for now onboarding must happen in the office got to come, you got to build that right culture. Um, so as I said, I think that is, is a learning is that we had an existing force that we could take home. We didn't, we did having said that, we did recruit a few people during the lockdown period, but was not at a contact center agent level. It was typically at a, at a supervisor managerial level where you can have to and fro interviews and teams calls and Zoom calls and sort of interview the guy correctly. And, uh, you know, build your relationship that way. But as far as the contact center is concerned, yeah, it was, uh, in, in, in my view, it has to happen in office. Hmm. Uh, Rhinos, what about you? What are you observing? Uh, you, you, uh, you talk to a lot of contact centers in Zimbabwe. Uh, any tips on or learnings on uh, onboarding and collaboration in the contact center, whether it's agent, supervisor, or the team members? Uh, any learnings there? I'm not sure if Rhinos could, uh, could hear us, so I'll try and bring him back uh, post uh, the next section. Uh, one of the things that we learned is uh, if you're onboarding new folks, uh, I think it's paramount that they are able to bond with the existing team in an informal manner. Rhinos, we are not able to hear you. I'm sorry. Uh, once I hear you, I'll bring you in. Uh, so one of the things that we learned was if you're bringing in new folks, they have to they have to have that informal bonding with their existing, uh, you know, the existing members, uh, so that that tribal culture of learning and collaboration can be formed. That's one. The second, and this is a big one, and this is maybe I'm predicting into the future that a newer kind of uh, uh, employee workplace is going to be generated in remote scenarios. People who are self-driven, people who are entrepreneurial, think about and in all parts of the world, think about uh, smart, intelligent uh, people who are bound to home. They're taking care of their kids. They cannot travel, but they have, let's say, four or five hours uh, at their hand, uh, and they will be happy uh, using their skills uh, in a remote scenario. This already had happened in uh, in United States with retired. Uh, uh, armed forces people and disabled people. There's a there's a big force of contact center agents uh, that that operate from home in that scenario. I believe in the uh, developed market in the developing market. There's actually a bigger workforce that will come in. Uh, they are available. They are skilled uh, and they are entrepreneurial. You don't need to micromanage them. Once they come on board, they understand what needs to be done. Think of sales roles. You would find uh, more entrepreneurs coming in and running this as their business rather than uh, you know it being run as a micromanaged process that's a, that's going to be another big change it's not a simple change it's a very huge change which has been forced upon us but people who are looking to run remote for long i think they they will start seeing experiments around onboarding and hiring very very quickly rhinos are you able to hear us uh, now i can bring you in if if you're there uh, I think he's facing some problem with the connection. It's okay. I'll I'll move forward because we'll just have like a, a five minute time. And the last point is on, and I touched it a little bit on what KPIs are you measuring? 
how do you go from average speed of answer average handling time to number of sales made in a day uh, or number of tickets closed in a day which are which are the uh, lagging indicators or result parameters rather than the leading indicators you have in your case uh, have you seen uh, agents being more responsible for non operational kpis or business kpis or was it always like that for you guys uh, can you can you throw some light on that can hear you now okay, so uh, can you hear me sir just just repeat your question i'm starting with connectivity you dropped in okay my my question was that uh, the kind of kpis that you were measuring uh, you know like average speed of answer average handling time has that changed to more business kpi like number of sales made number of tickets closed or was it always like that are you measuring different kpis uh, for your agents after pandemic no no so for us it's always been 100% output driven so the kpis are stayed as far as a number of sales or number of uh, policies that you took through the QA quality assurance process or number of tickets closed. Um, in our world, at least everything else is a, is sort of a, a means to an end. It's an input. And only when the agents don't perform or we have some performance issues, then we'll help the agents understand a bit more detail where they could improve by doing X, Y, and Z a little bit better. Um, so yeah, they're very much still output driven. And things like time to touch, um, you know, from a lead coming in to contact, that's a, that's more thing for the support staff, the dialer managers, and those guys to to keep an eye on. Um, we've sort of set up the system such that the agent must just sit there and just they're solely responsible for the output. That's very progressive, uh, you have, and uh, and we we recommend for most folks that uh, it should it should become more output driven now. Where if you're running remote, because you cannot micromanage and you should not micromanage. It's it's nearly impossible. You should do. You should do compliance and quality and those things are good but the results that the agent is responsible for have to be output matrices more and more now than ever before okay uh, uh at this point i would uh, request uh, if there are any questions we'll start taking them now i have a couple of questions and uh, just a quick glimpse of the remote solutions that we talked about uh, the areas that we mentioned uh, this, for example, is a dashboard that our IT manager sees on his desk for, for each agent. We, we monitor 15 infrastructure parameters, whether they are okay, not okay. Uh, there is a industry first mobile app for a complete contact center capability and not just a limited a click to call kind of functionality. You can run a predictive dialer, a very, very fast uh, uh, delivery. We, we, we are making new releases every 15 days on Play Store on the mobile app. Uh, some of our customers in the region uh, uh, and uh, uh, we have been growing well in South Africa through our partners. Uh, Arno represents Blue Cloud, who's our partner in uh, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Tech24, uh, you can get in touch. Uh, let me uh, let me take up, take the first question that I see, uh, which was put uh, you know, prior to the registration. And the question was, uh, uh, let, me, let me throw this to uh, Arno. Are no contact center as a service or cloud contact center. That's something which uh, I think South Africa had earlier, but this the adoption has increased now. If I am a contact center and I want to do it on cloud, what is it that is required uh, at my end? Uh, what is required to run contact center as a service uh, for a mid-sized contact center in South Africa? Yeah. So look, um, demand for contact center as a service obviously has skyrocketed, like you mentioned. Um, it's the best injection we could have had for for move, driving that transition. Um, but fundamentally, the, the primary requirement is good network connectivity, unique um, standard type PC with a decent headset, and the rest should be provided by your, your cloud provider. Um, you shouldn't have to install anything on the desktop. Um, it should be driven by standard browser technology. Um, to make it as simple as possible, you should basically be able to take a PC standard install off the shelf, uh, spin it up, uh, maybe install Chrome if you have to, uh, get it on a network, arrive a rival good connect connection, and you should be able to start up, log on, and operate. Um, th that should be what, what um, you should expect from a, you know, a cloud service of that nature. 
Yeah. yeah. And uh, just to add, you could actually get up and running in uh, you know, 24, 48 hours. And uh, today, the cloud contact centers uh, even offer private instances where you could actually do your enterprise grade integrations if required in it. It doesn't need to be on the public infrastructure only. Uh, second question, I think we have covered it in some detail, which was uh, how to maximize on experience while working from home in a banking situation. I, I don't know how somebody has been able to do that, uh, that a bank is allowing you to run a contact center work from home. But you have any thoughts? If, if I'm an agent and I'm running remote, uh, uh, what can I do? I mean, is there is there a... Uh, is there a tooltip or a guideline for me that this is what I should be doing? Uh, and hence I can apply for a remote contact center job. So just come again session. Yeah, if I'm an agent, if I'm an agent, uh, hello? Yeah, can you yeah. hear me now? Yeah, can you? Yeah, if I'm an agent working from home, any advice for me that what can I, what can I do to better serve my customers or do my job? Yeah, so I think um, what you picked up is discipline. Uh, you can't become uh, you can't become complacent. Say I'll do it a bit later. And um, I think like all of us, you know, you got to wake up in the morning. You got to put those work clothes on, whatever your work clothes attire is. And uh, yeah, just be disciplined and keep driving. And um, as we said, we found through it some of our top performers even became lazy. In some other cases, uh, it was just came down to personal behavior. And then of course, stuff that you can't go away from, as Anna mentioned, is connectivity. So we very much found. We just had some agents, some guys have been with us for a very long time. They just, we just couldn't get them working from home by no fault of theirs. Um, so you have, to have, you have to have the space, the dedicated workspace, the connectivity, and then ultimately the discipline. Yeah, I think you hit it on the head. So in, in most cases, we saw that the agents who were successful took the responsibility of infrastructure, making sure that they have infrastructure, because that was the the raw material required, you know, when I'm saying infrastructure, uh, you know, good, reliable connectivity uh, at worst case scenario, 5G, and then a basic uh, machine on which stuff can work, whether it's a laptop or a smartphone. These were two, and then uh, of course, a lot of motivation. And uh, so one thing that really helps, and you, I think you said it, when I realized it, that, uh, when you are sitting on your workstation or entering your work office, depending on you know whatever uh, the size of the, you get into that mindset of I am at work, and the best thing that you can do is say bye bye to your family, work, you know wear your work clothes and sit, and now you take a break when it's lunch, and it has worked like crazy. I mean my kids are next door, but they would not come in because they know that dad is at work right now, right? And it took me exactly. like four weeks to get into that rhythm, but but it's very very important to sort of break that pattern of this was family and now I am at work and if at my level of you know two decades of working it took me some time I think that's the best advice you on you you give a very very good advice that put your work clothes on and I'm at work that mindset really yeah. works every day cool so yeah I think we've run out of time guys but this was uh, this was a pretty enriching session if there are uh, if there are any questions we can take them now otherwise uh, feel free to send those questions to Shiva on email. Shiva, I, I thought you wanted to run the last poll before we call it a day. So while you are running yes. that poll, uh, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. In the meantime, Arno, you have uh, Rhinos, Rhinos, we, we had you on and off, but uh, thank you for your insight. You have absolutely a pleasure to talk to you. Arno, always uh, great to connect with you. If you guys would like to know more about the product, uh, especially in the remote scenario or want a demonstration, uh, we would be happy to get in touch with you. Just mark a yes here. Uh, uh, otherwise, we'll see you in the next webinar. By the way, there's a, uh, there is a webinar we are doing on the 21st, I think, uh, which, which is the latest offering on Google Business Message. This is a new channel, especially for the lead acquisition use case. If you get a lot of website traffic, and they come on your website and then call you or come on your website and uh, do a chat with you. Now they can initiate that chat from within Google search or Google maps. So as, as soon as let's say if, if from your mobile you search Ameo, you will find an option to chat with Ameo right within Google search and it will go to our agent. So this technology is now integrated into Ameo and we can go live on cloud in less than a day and it's extremely cost effective. Should definitely give it a try. 
Okay, thank you so much, uh, gentlemen. Uh, uh, wish you all, your loved ones and family, great health. And uh, hopefully within this year or next year, I'll be able to see all three of you. That's a good wish uh, to make these days. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, Nimesh, Shiva, thank you so much for organizing this. Goodbye and have a great day, gentlemen. Thank you, everyone. Uh, before signing off, I would request you all to attend uh, to uh, fill up a small survey while you'll be closing this particular window. There will be a small survey. Just fill it up. And once again, thank you so much for joining today.